Then I'll reiterate, it's a boon to have come from Ganetikva, not far from Tel Aviv, to Skopje, to meet you and hear about the, all these interesting concepts. Being a grandiose narcissist, I fully agree with you. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't have said it better. <laughs> okay, so now we're talking about uh, the following topic, the dangers and promises, dangers on the one hand and promises, of extended virtual and augmented realities from cities to the metaverse. The floor is yours. What I'm referring to is the process of uh, virtualization. There is a general retreat, a general escape from what, are we, what, what we called in our previous conversation the, the preferred or pri privileged frame of reference, which is reality. We talked in our previous conversation yeah. about the reality. The, reality, the, 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 the one that is... The, the real reality. The reality where you have no volition. You are in it, you are Im immersed in it, you are, it's directly accessible. And it's unmediated. As opposed to simulations. Simulations which require technology of some kind or at the minimum an act of will, a decision right. to enter the simulation. Okay. So there is a general tendency to move from reality to simulations. That's true generally. Started with the cinema, not with, uh, not with computer. Or the theater. Or the well, theater. Yeah. Yes. The theater. But theater was not that immersive in the sense that uh, it didn't require an act of dissociation as the cinema does. That's why when the first movie was was uh, projected on the screen, it was a, a train, a train coming into a station. Right. People ran away. Ran away. They, they were panicked. They were in panic yes. because they thought the train was going to run you, over them. You, you can't yeah. do that uh, yeah. in a, in, in a in theater. theater. Yes. yes. So I think actually the cutoff is the cinema. We started to seriously evade and avoid reality when the cinema started, and then it became, of course, with computing, it became an enormous trend. And now we have uh, unleashed upon us the metaverse, which we will discuss in a minute. So I call this process virtualization. But virtualization to started, in my view, even earlier, let's say seven to 10,000 years ago, when we moved from uh, villages and farms and agriculture and the land and the soil, we move to cities. Cities are simulations, in effect. Cities are totally artificial creations. They are, they, they are not, they're much less real than when you are in nature, when you're working the land, when you're growing your own food and so on. In a city, you, you in, inhabit confined spaces and within these spaces, you can make belief that you are not dependent, everything comes to you, the food comes to you from the countryside and so on. So we already, in, in urbanization, we already have the rudimentary primordial elements of virtualization, a retreat from nature, a retreat from reality, a retreat from the land into spaces which are brain children. These spaces are brain children of architects. They are, they are actually translations wow. translations of the minds of architects, so, which is a good definition of simulation, by the way. Okay, so we went from agriculture to cities, and that, that created a major psychological revolution. Because when you are in agriculture, you need to have a specific psychology. And when you move to the city, and the city is the dream or the brainchild of an architect, in effect, you move into a dream state. Your psychology changes in a city. Two or three examples. In agriculture, you need to have a very well-developed sense of time. You need to follow the seasons. You, know, to, you need to know when to, to seed and when to plant and when to, to sow and when to reap. reap. And so, when to harvest. So, time is of crucial importance. There's a lot of time awareness in agriculture. Second thing, in agriculture, you need to delay gratification. You put a seed in the ground, you need to wait. You can't just immediately reap the re reward. You need to have a lot of patience. Yes. You need to, in short, in, ag in agriculture, you, you pay for the consequences of your actions. There's a direct linkage between your actions and the consequences of your actions. And it takes time. It takes time. 
And it takes patience. And planning. Planning and investment and commitment and patience and so on. What do we call all this? Maturity. In agriculture, agriculture forced upon you maturity. You were mature or you were dead. These were two options. Mature or dead. You can't run, run a farm without being a farmer. You, yeah. And to be a farmer, you need to be highly mature. Or you're dead. Simple. Dead in, I mean, like dead. Like you don't have what to eat. So, but cities change the psychology of people. Because they had immediate rewards. They could go to a grocery store and buy bread. They didn't need to, to, to plant. They didn't need to wait. They didn't need to reap. They didn't need to harvest. They just went to the grocery store and bought a bread, a loaf of bread. There was a time when they bought uh, flour, and, flour and, and, ma all. and made bread. But even that, that it's... That, that changed. Even that well. is one hour. It, it's definitely not six months or seven months. Right. So the horizon, the time horizon was compressed, became compressed. And the level of maturity um, deteriorated. People became much more infantile. They became much more dependent. In the city, the city fosters in you total dependence. On many, many, um, uh, on many agents. Yes. On the suppliers of food, on food, suppliers water, of water, of, you name of it. gas. You're, you're uh, totally dependent. Electricity, I mean, whatever it is, you're dependent. The organizing principle of cities is dependency. The organizing principle of agriculture is self-reliance. Simple. Fact. So, the psychology change, of course, because you adapt to your environment. We will talk about it when we talk about culture. You adapt to your environment, so psychology change. And it's another author thing. It's author 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 autarchic. Autarchic. autarchic versus... Yeah, the, the farm is autarchic. Yeah. <coughs> and another thing happened in the cities. The unnatural agglomeration of human beings in one location, which was essentially a dreamscape, someone's dream, the architect or whatever. Yeah. Lafayette, when Lafayette designed cities, it was totally his dream state. He, he designed these wide avenues and, you know, architects have a huge influence on, on our habitat. Okay. And so we inhabit architects' minds, including this room. Is someone, was once someone's dream or fantasy, you know. So when, when this agglomeration, when this crowding, started, people felt the need to be noticed. They felt the need to be seen. In a typical agricultural community, everyone knows everyone. Of course. And you are seen by everyone all the time. In a city, no one sees you. No one notices you. So you develop a compulsion to be seen and to be noticed. And your behavior escalates as you try to attract attention. Now, why do we need to be seen? Because it's a survival thing. Babies need to be seen by mommy. If they're not seen by mommy, they die. So the need to be noticed is to, primordial. To, to call their, their yeah. mother, they, yeah. they cry. They cry to, to be noticed. To be noticed. And what, is, what, is, what do we do on social media? We cry. We, we cry. cry out for... Yeah. for um, the language tells you this. Crying out loud. Yes. You're cr in social media, you are crying out loud. You're infantilized. You become a baby again. You want mommy world to notice you. It's instinctive. It's reflexive. It's not, you know, it's not mediated via. It's just what we need to be seen and noticed. It's, it's very basic. So this is the city. Imagine virtualization from farm to city had this massive impact on us. Imagine what's going to happen when we transition from cities to the metaverse. The metaverse is a much more profound a form of virtualization. It's going to have much more profound psychological impact. What, what is the metaverse? What is the metaverse? I knew you would ask. I thought you would never ask. <laughs> okay. A metaverse is a combination of technologies mm -hmm. which provide online simulations which you can then inhabit using specialized uh, devices and technology at this stage, but probably in 20, 30 years, you wouldn't need these devices. Everything will be uh, Wi-Fi through the air. But right now, right this very second, to inhabit these simulations, you need goggles, you need haptic gloves, you need all kinds of things. And then if you do wear this equipment, it's wearables, 
if you wear this equipment, you are able to totally access the simulation and you have no interface, no contact with reality. You are utterly inside the simulation. Are you alone there? You could be alone, you could be with other people. And these other people, they also have to wear these yes. accessories? Yes, everyone has to wear the same accessories and you can share a space, a simulation space. They don't have to be in the same room like you. One can be in Thailand, one in Israel, one in Russia and all three of you can be in the simulated space. And everybody knows in his or her mind yes. that, th that this happens. That, that's what, where Chalmers, Chalmers is wrong, yes. Okay. Everyone has to wear these things, make a decision, turn on the computer. This is not reality. It's not reality by okay. any stretch of the, of the word. Anyhow, the transition from farm to cities was, a, a, was virtualization because we inhabited someone else's mind. What is a simulation? Someone, someone is designing the simulation. Someone is coding and programming the simulation. It is another person's brainchild. It's another pers person's fantasy and dream. So when we moved to far from farm to cities, we moved into architectural fantasies, architectural virtualization. When we are, now we're going to move from cities to metaverse, we're going to move into a programmer's dream or a coder's fantasy. Okay. The psychological revolution that happened when we moved to agriculture, from agriculture to cities, is nothing compared to the psychological revolution that will happen when we all finally, finally move into the metaverse, which is a question of time. And, and, and you're probably thinking of further infantilization. Infantilization. They utter, utter but I'm, not, I'm worried even more by other things. For example, the metaverse is sol solipsistic in the sense that in the metaverse you are totally self-sufficient. You do interact with other people, but you don't need them. And sometimes you don't want them. So other people become commoditized. They become like avatars. They become like representations, symbols, uh, game elements, figments. So solipsism. Second thing, the metaverse will encourage you to be even more self-sufficient than you are now. Here is the thing, the more self-sufficient you become, the less you tend to interact with people. That's been proven now beyond any doubt. People interact less with other people if they can avoid it. <laughs> if they can... And the more you, uh, you avoid the more you tend to avoid it, yes. it's escalating. It's self-perpetuating, it's addictive, yes. So self-sufficiently leads to asocial behavior, not antisocial, not criminal, not, but asocial. Not necessarily. Not necessarily, can be antisocial, but asocial definitely, in the sense that you will avoid people. You, you, your needs to interact with other human beings will be fully gratified uh, via the metaverse. Even if you want to have sex with someone, you will have sex alone in your room wearing a suit, a suit, a physical that suit simulates that simulates the sex, the touch, sex. feel, smell, yeah. and so on. So you will not really need other people. We already see this happening. Already we are seeing this happening. When huge swaths of humanity are totally isolated, atomized. How long does it take? I mean, can you stay there? You, don't, you have to eat, you have to drink. No. You the don't? No. The metaverse is a total solution. In the, well, you have to eat and drink, of course. But the metaverse is a total solution in the sense that your workplace will be in the metaverse. Your company will open a site in the metaverse and you will go to work there. What will you produce? We, anyhow, we produce nowadays something like 80% of the economy is manipulation of symbols. Anyhow, what is an accountant? He manipulates symbols. What is a lawyer? They manipulate symbols. So today, 2% uh, of the population is engaged in agriculture. Two. In the developed world. In not, the developed Not in agriculture. Even, in, by the way, even in, uh, in not developed world, less developed worlds, we are, we are already talking about 25% compared to 80 and 90 percent only, only 40 years ago. So clearly physical professions, professions which, which deal with the manipulation of physical objects one way or another, industry, agriculture, they're dying, they're disappearing. But we, ha we need iron, we need... Uh, we robots. Need tables. Uh, robots. Robots. A typical, a typical person in a Toyota factory, a single person, produces 100 cars. 
when per, per produces per, 100 cars per day per day per day when when uh, only only 40 years yes in the 90s in the 80s i'm sorry only 40 years ago you needed 100 people to, to produce, produce 100 cars ah 100 cars so the difference is robotization and automa and um, and uh, automation so robotization and auto automation and computerization and so on and so forth they will take over most professions and we will begin to manipulate symbols so already for example the video game industry is much much bigger than the cinema industry much bigger people spending times instead of going to watch a movie they spend times Play playing stay playstations to be able to why because why? the video game is, makes you is much more simulation than the movie it makes you active yes it you're renders in it. you active you're in, you're in it you, it's a simulation. you you influence the movie yes it's a simulation you control the environment somehow you even control the plot by the way many video games allow you to decide which what is the plot where, where the video game is going so the metaverse will encourage you to disconnect from humanity completely and you will work in the metaverse have sex in the metaverse shop for fashion in the metaverse do everything in the metaverse except physiological and speaking factors. about uh, your uh, wanting to be noticed is there this element uh, there of too? course because in the metaverse you could be you could be anything you want you can be a rock star you can be a stripper there's an application called VR Chat where, where unfortunately adolescents go and they strip and, and have group sex. And it's know. like the seven lives of Walter Mitty, but uh, in, in intensified. Immersive. Immersive in the sense that you are in it wholly and truly and totally. And so these are the out, these are the, the this is the, the metaverse. Now, there are some philosophical issues here very deep philosophical issues. Unfortunately, at this stage, not, not well noticed. All the tech, first of all, all the technology until 19, the 1990s, all technologies were about extending the human body. You name one technology and I will show you how it extends the human body. The sword extended your hand. The boat extended your, your hands when you swim. The, I mean, the car extended your legs. I mean, all technologies were extensions of the body. Or the mind, or the brain, which is also part of the body. In the 1990s, for the first time, we have transitioned from technologies that extend the brain, the, the mind and the body, to technologies that allow us to, to evade and escape from reality. So today, majority of technologies are about avoiding reality, are about escaping from reality. That's the first thing. And a battle, a war is erupting. It's not a war about how you experience reality, because all previous technologies were about how you experience reality. For example, consider the internet. <clears throat> you have a browser. Yeah? You have a browser. What is a browser? A browser structures the way that you experience the internet. It is through the browser that you experience the internet. And the browser has limitations and specifications. So browser tells you how to experience the internet. Similarly, cinema. Similarly, all other technologies, they, they structure your experience, including the travel industry, including transportation. All of them structured your experience, structured your reality, told you how to experience reality. The new, the new technologies are not about how you experience reality. They are about who owns reality. If I own a simulation, I own your reality. I don't only own how you experience reality, but I own your reality. You are coming into my reality. When you are using my simulation, you are entering my reality. So I'll see if I understand. If 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 I choose to go to Italy via Alitalia, they have their plans of of shipment of of flying, and and I know that I go to them, and they'll fly me to Rome or to Naples. Yes, but they don't control Rome. They don't control the act of traveling. They don't control your decision to travel. They control very little. But they do structure your reality. They do, because In they tell me how, how long it's going yes. to take. Yes, so they control your experience. How many stops on the so way. they control so your experience. Yes. But in the future, Alitalia will own Rome. 
In what way? In this simulation. In this, or in the simulation. In this analogy. In this, in this analogy. analogy. When you come to my simulation, I own this reality. I, I am your reality. So this must be the danger, right? Because it's a huge danger because... We're talking about dangers and promises. Yes, because it's a danger because there will be people and corporations who will own reality. First time in human history will own reality. That's a, a one danger. Second danger, they will, it will be their interest to blur the boundaries between reality and simulation. They would want you to spend more time in the simulation because more time you spend in the simulation, more money they're making. So they will structure the simulation to blur... And to make it addictive. To, to make it addictive and to blur, blur the, the borders, the boundaries, borders, borders. So that you will no longer be able to tell. You will be like in a constant trip, constant drug haze. You know? You will no longer be able to tell uh, which is which. They are also going to narrow reality. What they're going to do is a process called twinning. Twinning is when a simulation borrows elements from the privileged frame of reference, from reality. Simulation borrows elements from reality and then pretends that these elements belong to the simulation, not to reality. Give, so, uh, give me an example if you can. Well, um, imagine, that, um, imagine that you, again, you want to read a book. Okay? Imagine you want to read a book. Reading a book is an experience in reality, obviously. The simulation will take the book, make you believe that you are sitting near a physical table and reading the a physical book, and then claim that this experience always had belonged to the simulation. Is not is a simulation specific. And, and the game. book since I, if if I want to read Chaucer, I'm crazy. I yeah. want to read Chaucer. Will I get Chaucer yeah. in the simulation? They will have all the, all the, all the, already you have all the all physical books available online. So but you will not be able to tell the difference. You will feel that you are really sit sitting at a physical table, reading a real book, and gradually you will be begin to associate this experience with a simulation, not with reality. They will appropriate reality and convince you that they're delivering this to you, not reality. And this is called twinning. It's a very dangerous process. And finally, of course, it will create addiction in some people, not everyone. But many people, I think we are talking about 30-40% of the population, become addicted. And we already know from studies that exposure to simulations and screens enhance, I mean, increases depression and anxiety in people. We know that, we have studies by Twenge and others, that um, the more exposed you are to simulated states and screens, the more you are likely to develop depression and anxiety, Actually, among users of social media, in a period of 10 years only, anxiety has gone up 500 percent. Wow! And depression has gone up 300 percent. And this is only with social media. Only social media, which is not not simulation. It's not. Not immersive. No, you know but, that you're in Facebook. But or in it Twitter. encourages a, a certain divorce from reality because that's why they're using words like friends. Ah, friends. You know, I'm going to make a comparison that is very distasteful. When the Nazis took the Jews to Auschwitz. They put them in a bath. They told them they're going to have a bath, a right. shower, a shower, a shower, shower, baden. They told them they're going to have a shower. Calling someone on Facebook a friend, someone you've never met, is this Nazi technique of mislabeling and misnaming things with the intent to deceive. So, a friend is a well-defined figment of reality that Facebook had appropriated it. Not a figment, sorry. A real, a real thing. It's, it's not a figment. An element of reality. Uh, uh, yes. A, it's an a, element a, of A friend is a real thing. It's a real thing. It's an element of reality. That Facebook had appropriated this, and now when we say friend, we think actually more about Facebook than about reality. When I say friend, you, many... I don't know. You and I, we, we, we consider generations. friend as a friend, but uh, if we go... To, if I grow to my, go to my granddaughter, maybe sh she considers friends. Almost for sure. When you say friend, she will think of Facebook or some other platform. So they had appropriated this element of reality and they made this element theirs, but deceitfully. Because a friend of Facebook is not a friend in reality as well. It's just a stranger. He may be a friend. He may be, but he's not in most cases. I have 5,000 uh, 
friends on Facebook. And how many of them do? How many? Maybe maybe a hundred. Maybe, maybe two hundred. Maybe three hundred. Maybe, maybe a thousand. thousand. The other four thousand are. They're not friends. No. And yet they're passers, called. And yet they're, they're called friends. They're passers-by. It's like the Baden in Auschwitz. I'm wow. sorry to say. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So you talk. You talked about. The, I think you talked about the dangers. Everything. Are there also promises? Well, the promise is that some things can be delivered more efficaciously. So, for example, work probably will improve through the metaverse because collaboration will be more integrated and more efficient. Efficiencies, I think, mostly. That's, I, the, only, the only thing I can see is efficiencies. Plus, of course, there are segments of the population. For example, disabled people. Uh -huh. So, for them, the metaverse will be a blessing. will allow them to travel all over the world because tourism will be a big thing in metaverse. They will allow, it will allow, allow them to have sex. So it will open up the world to mentally ill people, disabled people and so on. It's a segment of the population. It's not without its merits and it, without its blessings, but if it is left to its own devices and the usage is not limited and restructured, we are in enormous danger as a species. In enormous danger. It's a serious threat in my view.